The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost is lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is liberty nation with tim donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. A nation under siege after a lethal bad virus producing depression-level joblessness, the police execution of an unarmed citizen, and riots in the streets of every major city. Just how much more can America take? Welcome back in to Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com and heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Just as we start to get our feet back on the ground, the nation is ground to a halt again by peaceful protests infiltrated by sociopathic elements in our society, exploiting the pain and hijacking the true narrative about police misconduct. We'll examine the backwash from all this with voices from multiple angles, including the sad descent of New York City, with the brilliant author Heather MacDonald discussing her article, Darkness Falls, in which she uses hard data to disprove the notion that white people commit most interracial crime. Plus, Bill Gates... You know him as super wealthy, but did you know he also seeks to control world health? Political columnist Pennell Bird from LibertyNation.com joins us to discuss his landmark three-part series on the world's second richest man and the designs he has long had on vaccinating the entire world, like it or not. Plus, with all the voices decrying the actions of those cops in Minneapolis, LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza discusses solutions, starting with serious reforms to police unions. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. We kick things off with our signature segment, Say What?, where we roll out a virtual assembly line of wacky, astonishing, damnable, and ultimately revealing things uttered by politicians and the chattering class. As bad as things got this week around the nation, let's start with one courageous action that likely prevented things from getting a whole lot worse. It didn't get as much play as it should have from the Trump deranged media presenting the riots as another in a long line of Trump scandals. And that's because Terrence Floyd, the brother of the man killed by those Minneapolis cops, invoked the almighty as he begged protesters for an end to the violence. Where are y'all going? Y'all doing nothing because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. My family is a peaceful family. My family is God-fearing. Let's do this another way. Let's stop thinking that our voice don't matter. That's right. And vote. Do this peacefully. Please. Terrence Floyd and his family, friends, associates, kneeled in a prayer circle for peace and calm, and the violence melted away. But the elite media preferred to focus on perverting the actions of President Trump, per usual, after Trump said he would use whatever force is necessary to, as he said, dominate the streets. Anderson Cooper on CNN called it basically an excuse for fascism. We are witnessing a failure of presidential leadership at a time when this country, when we the people need it more than ever, perhaps in our lifetime. The president seems to think that dominating black people, dominating peaceful protesters is law and order. It's not. He calls them thugs. Who is the thug here? Okay, for just a moment, just a moment. Imagine if someone on Fox News called Barack Obama a thug 
or for that matter, a fascist, racist, white supremacist, uh, of course, not that, uh, like they've been calling Trump for years. But here's a question for you. What happened to all the centuries-long white supremacy you decry as if roving gangs of white people are prowling around looking for black people to beat up or kill? What happened to that white supremacy when Barack Obama was president for eight years? But suddenly, when Trump is elected, the country is completely given over to white supremacy. Of course, Anderson Cooper and his fellow inside Washington so-called journalists can make sweeping, virtue-signaling statements from the sheltered comfort of their studios. But what people like him say mean absolutely nothing, just empty calories revealing their own ignorance What does mean something are the viewpoints of people who've actually been on the ground and paid a price seeking racial justice, like Andrew Young, who was mentored by Martin Luther King Jr. as he watched protests in Atlanta this week. The quieter and calmer the demonstration is, the more powerful and effective it is. We were with the Klan that was acting worse than this and beating us up in St. Augustine. But when they came down and marched through the community, uh, we sang to them and welcomed them. And the power of people being able to forgive publicly was one of the things that swung the Congress uh, to vote for civil rights legislation. Everything that they are enjoying down there, we fought for. There you go. These people, the peaceful protesters and the savages exploiting the nation's pain, are beneficiaries of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. But the side effect is that Democrats have controlled urban America for decades and their single-mindedness about race has been devastating, according to longtime conservative community activist Bob Woodson. After 50 years of, of liberal Democrats running the inner cities where we have all of these inequities that we have, Race is being used as a ruse, as a means of deflecting attention away from critical questions such as why are poor blacks failing in systems run by their own people? And if we continue to look at life through a racial prism, when, when evil wears a black face, it will escape detection and therefore correction. But the corrections necessary to tame the beast of racial bias is for white people to just get with the program and admit the country is in the grips of systemic racism. Why, just listen to the woman known as Hanoi Jane, actress Jane Fonda. Because we're white, we have we have had privilege. Even the poorest of us have had privilege, and um, and we need to recognize that, and we have to understand what it is that keeps racism in place: the policies, redlining, banking policies, mortgage policies, um, all of the things that are are really making it very very difficult for black people to lift themselves up. The policies have to be changed, and then white people have to understand the history. It has led to this, and we have to get to know black people, and they have to become our friends. You mean like, I'm not a racist. One of my best friends is black. (laughs) But Nicole Hannah-Jones, the radical woman who started the famous or infamous 1619 Project at the New York Times, claiming the real founding of the country was not with the Declaration of Independence in 1776, but the arrival of slave ships in 1619, says open racists are infiltrating the police. The FBI put out a report just a couple of years ago uh, raising the alarm about the infiltration of uh, police forces across this nation by white supremacist groups, including the Ku Klux Klan. And in fact, the role that police departments have played has been to enforce uh, racial laws and racial policies against black Americans. Racial laws, racial policies? No word as to what those specific laws or policies are or where they're written. But the point is, 
that it makes for the useful narrative of America as a boldly white supremacist country. Now, we'll close with something at once amusing and remarkably ignorant, which means it's something said by presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, this time in response to how the police can be reformed. The idea that instead of standing there and teaching a cop who is an unarmed person coming at him with a knife or something to shoot him in the leg instead of in the heart is a very different thing. <laughs> Aim for the leg, not the heart. Hey, as someone said, why not try to shoot the gun out of the perpetrator's hand, just like they do on TV? Right. But we said it, with all the heated rhetoric about race these days, you would think white people are shooting black people indiscriminately, when in fact, the reverse is true. We'll explain when we return. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com. With one click, you get tomorrow's news today with LNTV's hot topics and analysis, Liberty Nation Radio, the Uprising and Rabbit Hole podcasts, and dozens of insightful original articles. While the media establishment giants are sleeping, you can stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com and get tomorrow's news today. LibertyNation.com We believe that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Well, we've all read the many screeds in the media about the George Floyd killing and its barbaric aftermath, flash mobs, gangs roaming the streets, people's lives and businesses destroyed. It's been quelled somewhat from the worst of it earlier in the week. But if you, like me, are looking for more than the usual virtue signaling, ain't it awful, it's all white supremacy or all Trump's fault type of analysis of of the real facts on the ground surrounding urban violence in this country in general, in New York in particular, you could do no better than to read a brilliantly composed article entitled Darkness Falls by one of the most respected free market writers of our times, Heather McDonald of the City Journal and Manhattan Institute out of New York, and author of the recent books The War on Cops and the diversity delusion, and she joins us now. Welcome to Liberty Nation Radio, Heather. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Tim. I greatly appreciate it. Well, I appreciate having you. been reading your stuff for many years. Now, your book, The War on Cops, How the New Attack on Law and Order Makes Everyone Less Safe, seems perfectly tuned to the times we're living in. But you wrote that book back in 2016. So how has your assessment of the relationship between cops and communities changed in the wake of the horrors we've witnessed over these last days? Well, I fear that what I wrote about uh, back in 2016 is going to be even worse now. I talked about something I called the Ferguson effect, which is officers backing off of that essential discretionary proactive policing that saves so many lives. We saw that in 2015 and 2016, followed, following the much more limited, in, in comparison, uh, riots in Ferguson and Baltimore. Another 2,000 black lives were lost uh, because of officers backing off. Now, and, and we also saw assassinations of cops in, in 2016. Uh, five in Dallas, several more in Baton Rouge. We're already seeing that in in a mere w- one week. I I fear that cops have a target on their back now. The rage that is being fomented against them based on no data whatsoever about police racism is going to be very hard to come dial back. And the people who are going to be hurt the most, apart from the officers who, as I say, are at risk of their lives are the law-abiding inner-city residents who desperately beg the police for more protection. So let's talk data instead of narrative. You write uh, in your article that facts don't matter to the academic victimology narrative. Far from destroying the black body, whites are 
overwhelming targets of interracial violence. And then you bring in the actual numbers. Between 2012 and 15, blacks committed 85 percent of all black-white interracial violent episodes even though they're just 13% of the population, and then it's flipped. Whites committed 14% of interracial violent crime, even though they're the majority. So the numbers are completely inverted. Is this something that people are even open to hearing anymore? No, because the media have done such a good job for the last three or four decades at concealing the reality of street crime in the United States. Uh, I'm going to be very blunt here, Tim. Street crime, I'm talking about drive-by shootings, robberies, uh, gun homicides of, of, of strangers as opposed to domestic violence. Violent street crime today has a black and a brown face. Let me give you some data. Uh, in Chicago, blacks and whites are each about a third, a little under a third of the population. Blacks commit 80% of all shootings, whites less than 1%. The black Chicagoan is, is 50 times more likely to commit a drive-by shooting than a white is. In New York City, uh, blacks and Hispanics commit 98% of all shootings. That's according to the victims and witnesses of those shootings, who are overwhelmingly black and Hispanic themselves. So, the pub, you remember the media in the 90s stopped publishing the race of crime suspects because it was so overwhelmingly, uh, they were so overwhelmingly black. And so the public has no idea what goes on in inner city communities and why cops are there. Uh, disproportionately, it's because they're called there by victims who've just been robbed or who've just been shot. I mean, the numbers don't lie, but you also write about what you call the ideological handmaiden of this violence, academia. Explain what you mean by that. Well, academia has pumped out for the last three decades the white supremacy conceit, and now we see it has completely taken hold in the culture at large. So universities are committed to racial victimology, to identity politics. Uh, Many corporations that are run by their HR departments are run by gender studies and race studies graduates. Now, let's talk about New York City, both from you as a journalist and a resident of New York City, which was my home growing up. How will New York City be changed after the double whammy of COVID-19 taking a greater toll on New York than any city in the nation? And then this almost unchecked violence in the streets and a mayor who seems to have no clue what to do. Uh, They asked this before, Heather, but I'll ask it again to you. Will New York ever be the same? No, and the real problem is is not the actual virus toll. It's the fear that's been created. It's the ridiculous uh, social distancing rules, which are completely arbitrary. Uh, the, the economy was already on the ropes thanks to the economic lockdowns. Uh, people were already fleeing the city. Now uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely hopeless. Well, all I can say, Heather, is that I hope you're wrong. I thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Tim. It's great talking to you. Heather McDonald, you can read her stuff at cityjournal.com, and it'll be well worth your while. She's one of the best. Quick break, and then we're back to discuss Bill Gates and his plan to take over world health. It's not a conspiracy theory. The evidence is right before our eyes. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Far more important than my political future and far more important than yours, the well-being of our country. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. You know about Bill Gates for most of this century, the richest man in the world, now second only to Amazon's Jeff Bezos. But if you think Bill Gates is just about accumulating wealth, well, think again. In a riveting three-part series running right now on LibertyNation.com, the newest member of the LN team, Pennell Bird, 
explains how Gates has long had designs not so much on accumulating untold wealth that's inconceivable to most of us, but the power that flows from it, power to change the world, to mold it or coerce it into his globalist vision of the future. And you'll be shocked to learn just how prominent Gates has been in the coronavirus whirlwind, pushing the world to remain shuttered for months on end. And Pennell Bird joins us now. It's a pleasure, Mr. Bird. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be with you today, Tim. I'm thrilled to be part of Liberty Nation, and uh, I, you guys couldn't have been more welcoming of me uh, in my first weeks here. Thrilled to have the Bill Gates uh, article uh, published on such a incredible website, so thank you. So, as we like to say here at Liberty Nation, the bird is the word. So, (laughs) you go through great detail in your series about Bill Gates' desire to dominate the conversation about and the cure for Mm COVID-19. So, Mm -hmm. what's the problem with that? My issue is with the idea that Bill Gates sees good health as coming exclusively from a needle. You know, it's sort of in versus the idea of eons of um, human development. I mean, the idea that our immune systems were strong enough to get us where we are, uh, but from now on we need only vaccination to keep us healthy is antithetical to sensible thinking. Bill Gates doesn't give enough credit. In fact, his foundation in Africa and elsewhere devotes a very small fraction of its money to things like clean water, sanitation, sewage, um, and proper s- sanitary practices like washing hands. The rest of it is all, devel- is all devoted to uh, vaccines. And so my issue with Bill Gates is that he is trying to vaccinate the entire planet, and no one really understands how many failures he's had on that front and how dangerous that is as an ideology. If you look at any graph uh, of the century, you, you'll see very clearly that as sanitation uh, became, uh, and, su- and modern sewage became the rule rather than the exception throughout the land, throughout the, our country, uh, diseases and infectious diseases and deaths from infectious diseases went down dramatically. It was at that moment that Salk, Jonas Salk, uh, did his great, you know, his interesting work about vaccination. And so basically vaccines came in at the moment where we had already dramatically decreased uh, infectious diseases and mortality from that and basically took all the credit. Tim, it's like if it's like uh, when I'm in the uh, when I'm in the kitchen, my wife's working the uh, mayonnaise jar. She can't get the top off. She can't get the top off. She works on it for a minute. Then she says, hey, can you get this off for me? I come over and pop it off. Well, I get all the credit for taking the top off, but she played a huge part in that because she was she was opening it first. That's basically what vaccines did. And Gates is giving too much credit to um, a 50s technology that really hasn't been improved upon. I mean, it's like saying, uh, you know, let's use rotary telephones. We need to update vaccines if we're going to continue to use them in the way that we have. And we need to make our federal government responsible for safety testing. That is a duty that they have neglected. They were sued by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Del Bigtree of Children's Health Defense and ICANN, which is the Informed Consent Action Network, in 2018. And the Departments of Health and Human Services had to concede in a court of law that they had not been doing oversight for vaccine safety something they were charged with doing since the 1980s. So let me repeat that. Our government is responsible for vaccine safety testing, should have been doing it since 1987. They had to admit they've done none of it. So Bill Gates trying to jump in and say the vaccine is our, is our, our savior, our, our Jesus in a bottle, is crazy. Scarlet fever is no longer around. Did we have a vaccine for scarlet fever? No, we did not. Well, this single-mindedness about a vaccine belies the fact that so many times over the years we've developed vaccines after uh, a virus has already come and gone. And 
we look at you, you. You talk about scarlet fever. What about AIDS? AIDS from 1980. That's 40 years ago. Was deadly. It's no longer deadly. But they've never, to this day, developed a vaccine for AIDS, and yet the treatment for it makes it a treatable illness rather than a death sentence. There has never been a successful coronavirus vaccine developed ever. They've been trying for years and years. Don't you think that if they could have made a vaccine to cure the common cold, which is a coronavirus, they would have done it? Of course they would have. They have not been able to do it. The last 17 years, they've been trying really, really hard. But somehow, Bill Gates, with all his money, uh, is going to develop a coronavirus vaccine in a matter of months that he wants to give to every single person on the planet. But he wants to keep the world shut down for up to 18 months until the vaccine is developed. To me, that's the thing that that is the most frightening with no background in science or medicine. But yeah, I mean, that that to me is the is the real problem. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's how my article starts out. It, It points out that Bill Gates has no medical background at all. And yet he's making determinations for you know, 7.5 billion people on this planet that we have to stay locked down. Look, most of the science that we have, we didn't have any data at the beginning of this coronavirus. Everyone did as they were told because we were scared and we thought we'll look to our leaders and we'll do, we'll do what we have to. But we have data, a lot of data, which is indicating that quarantines may be more harmful than helpful. Even Anthony Fauci said that th- last week. And The fact that we've locked people down and we're, you know, the ripple effect of locking people indoors is something without precedent. And we're already seeing spikes in suicide, in um, deaths from alcoholism, from drug abuse, OD, from um, spousal abuse, child abuse. These numbers are going to be catastrophic. And of course, they don't figure in to Bill Gates's calculus. He wants to keep people scared indoors and their immune systems continuing to be compromised. Look, our immune systems gain power and strength from our interactions in the natural world and with each other. Being locked indoors does nothing but harm our immune system. So we're going to stay inside for 18 months till Bill Gates rides in on a white steed with the, with the Jesus in a needle? I don't think so. Do you think Bill Gates believes that because he's the second richest man in the world, That means he must also be the smartest. The real problem, I think, is um, in thinking that you have all, by dint of your education and your intellect, your IQ, your uh, place in society, you have the intellectual capacity to make determinations about other people's lives. In this case, Bill Gates is talking about every human being on the planet. I'm going to make that policy. That's dangerous thinking. This is something Bill Gates has been doing for years. I'm an educator. Back in 2008, eight nine, Bill Gates decided, and I'm sure these things occur to him, you know, in his beautiful living room some night. He goes, you know what the problem is in the conversation with himself or maybe his wife? Here's the problem with education. I see it as this, this, and this. Well, when you have ideas that pop into your head and you have a hundred billion dollars, you can pretty quickly enact them, and that's a kind of that's a kind of intellectual fascism. So nobody said anything about Bill Gates's ideas for education, and they failed utterly. They failed utterly. He went in with a billion dollars. It failed. He got out. He didn't want to hear it didn't go well. He just abandoned it like a ghost town and moved on to this World Health Agenda. Thank you, sir. This is at once frightening and fascinating. I appreciate you joining us. It was my great pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having this conversation with me. Penel Bird, newest, latest, and greatest political correspondent at LibertyNation.com. We'll take a quick break, and then we're back with Talking Liberty. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Just talking loud, just say nothing. 
Well, all week we've been hearing about how awful things are on the streets. We've been seeing it. We've borne witness to mob violence that has infiltrated peaceful protests, all following the degrading and sickening death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. But while everyone else is saying, ain't it awful, what we're doing here today is to try and propose some real solutions based on the reality on the ground. And here to do so is LibertyNation.com's legal affairs editor and the man that we like to call our guardian of individual liberty, and that includes everyone from rank-and-file citizens up to cops, Scott David Cosenza. Hello, Scott. Hello, Tim, and thank you. Well, listen, let's get right to the heart of the matter. Things are awful, but they can be reformed in terms of the relationship between cops and communities. Let's start with union contracts. The problem with a lot of unions is that they're so powerful that their workers, when they commit abuses, uh, can't be fired. But it goes a step further when cops protected by unions have the power of government authority. Yes. Uh, the, the issue with the unions, Tim, is how one side of the negotiations are. So you have a typical, you know, most of these real, the, the worst abuses seem to take place in, in big cities. We're talking about Philly, Newark, New York, L.A., Chicago. These are places that have democratic control over the levers of government without any competition from Republicans. So the only competition is is at, is at primary time, if there's any there. Um, and the I think the police in these instances, they're seen as an interest group because of their union membership and their voting. And so they become bought off, right? The the union trades for political support and sometimes salary too uh, for more lenient uh, treatment in mm-hmm. any kind of disciplinary proceeding. Right. They have uh, really – it's just staggering, Tim. I wrote about for LibertyNation.com uh, this week about how uh, one of the Parkland High School uh, massacre coward police officers who did nothing and hid behind his car when – uh, the, the the students inside were being murdered. At a cost of the um, citizens of, I believe, $128,000 I think it was year. more than that. I think shy by it. Yeah, something, something like yeah. that. Um, and what happened was he got rehired with back pay. He was ordered rehired with back pay in May. And the reason why is because the city, the city didn't dot every I and cross every T in their dismissal. And according to the terms of the union contract, that was enough. Now, there could be... A contract clause inserted into that contract that says if the officer's behavior is so egregious that, you know, any I mean, I wouldn't word the exact words of the contract, but that any reasonable person would say this person is disqualified from being a police officer, then that dotting of the I's and crossing of the T's is not as important. Uh, You could have that. You could also have, Tim, the courts could say there are some uh, contracts that courts uh, rule are void as a matter of public policy. Let's say, for instance, there was a country that condoned slavery, and the, the, a person brought their slave over to the United States and ordered them to do something, and the slave said, "I'm not doing it." And they sued and said, "You have to do it. You're, you know, you're my slave." Well, the, our courts would say, "No, no, no. That is a void contract uh, as a matter of public policy. We will not enforce such a contract." They could say that a contract provision that allows a police officer. Um, who kills somebody uh, without legal justification to get their job back because some procedure wasn't fo- uh, followed under the terms of the union contract, that that is now – that's void as public policy. For instance, uh, the courts could also dial back uh, what's called qualified immunity. This is a court-created doctrine which holds that police officers are not generally liable for violations of people's civil rights unless that civil right – is very clearly established. Now, the problem, Tim, is that has gone very far afield from where it first started to where we now have police officers doing what I think would commonly be called outrageous things, including stealing from uh, suspects. And those uh, acts are being called within the umbrella of qualified immunity. So there's room for the Supreme Court there uh, as well. We've talked about union contracts, the problem with union power in basically one-party political situations where the Democratic Party just 
you know, controls a city so thoroughly as they have so many cities for so many years that there's not any kind of real negotiation. But one of the things we've discussed for as long as you and I have known each other in terms of the toll that it's taken on this country is the drug war. That's the elephant in the in the space, Tim. Uh, that's the number one reason I think we, we've got here. Uh, and th- that's a multi sort of fold problem as well. Like why why does that contribute so much to the climate where we're in? Well, one of the reasons why is because of the way the drug war was fought. Anytime you throw all your resources at, at trying to make one thing happen, uh, if, if your resources are the might of the federal you know, prosecutorial uh, class, basically, you're going to make some change. And, and that's what happened during the drug war. It was a absolute you know, fire hose of assault against our rights, uh, search and seizure and privacy, namely. Another sort of component of that is this stats game. Um, and for people who I really do think <laughs> it makes me laugh, as you know, I, I did go to law school, so it sounds silly for me to say. But the television series, The Wire, that if you want an education, a PhD in this drug war problem, watch all of The Wire, and it will lay out how these these things kind of layer on each other. So. Uh, you have uh, an inner city problem with government created, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the collapse of the family and uh, the, combined with horrible schools and limited opportunity. And then you have that's where the drug markets are. That's where the concentration is. And also enforcement is uh, more difficult in some of these areas. And so if you want a, a you know, decent job there, it's that's part of it. You know, that that that's what pays. Um, and they use the prohibition premium to kind of, you know, make a living for themselves. Mm-hmm. The cops, in order to fight that drug war, basically have to go to war against that community unless the community sees the drug people as enemies, in which case they might actually, but they don't because it's their cousins, their brothers, it's the guy across the way, it's the shopkeeper, it's somebody they went to school with, and they're people with problems, but they by and large are not killing the community. But the war itself, Tim, is what kills the community. And that's why you have a situation where in so many of these inner city neighborhoods, you know, there's a crime that happens. Nobody wants to call the police. Nobody wants the police yeah. involved. You can't talk to the police. Well, we talked about how when we were growing up, people referred to cops as peace officers or at a minimum, if you were in trouble, you wouldn't think twice about going to a cop to get him to help you. Now, that just isn't the case. So there's another component, too. You think, by the way, there's so many layers on this. Like, I'm ready for anybody to appoint me as king to dial back all these things. Now, it seems to me that the drug war is a subset of what you listed among the four issues that are particularly important and ripe for reform is overcriminalization, which includes the drug war, but it includes other petty well, crimes. It has to do with uh, filling the coffers of the municipalities. So it is that your car has to have uh, six different stickers, uh, and those are all taxes. And each one, if it's wrong, gives the police the right to pull somebody over, uh, gives them the chance for a negative interaction. Um so that kind of thing. We know Eric Garner, Tim, was killed because he uh, was a, was accused of not paying a tax on uh, a, a, the sale of cigarettes. That, that's what unlicensed cigarette sales. That, that's what killed him and the enforcement of that law. So every additional law with a criminal penalty that gives an officer a right to arrest somebody for it increases the likelihood that that's going to wind up like an Eric Garner situation. Well, I commend you for focusing on solutions based on deep knowledge that you have of the situation instead of, like everybody else, just decrying the problem. Thanks for joining us, Scott. Thank you, Tim. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott, and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose with our own Mark Angelides, where past is prologue. All of it available on demand at LibertyNation.com and from fine podcast providers everywhere. So that is it for this week, but we'll be back at you next week. Same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying, stand up for liberty. And we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio. Liberty Nation.